One, this is the Emperor Regent 1951 Epiphone Archtop, humongous guitar. And after much deliberation uh, between myself and the customer, it needed new frets, but the fingerboard was lifting from the nut to about the third fret. So I've decided to remove the fingerboard so I have complete control over the trajectory of the neck as well as taking a good look at the truss rod as I pull this sort of configuration apart and it will make more sense to you. So we're heating it up for about seven minutes. So these heat guards on either side are basically deflecting the heat so that it doesn't get onto the plastic binding. Okay, so now as we pull this apart, you'll get a better idea of what I'm doing here. I'm heating up this probe just on the buffing wheel and that'll allow me to sort of get in and I'm going to kind of work this fingerboard cap off. Keep my feeler gauges handy. Kind of shove those in as we go. Kind of hold our spot for us. Come on the other side here, same deal. Sorry, I can't switch the camera around right now because I'm and they're busy getting this thing off. Get another feeler gauge in here. Good. Okay, that's definitely uh, moving along. We're going to set up again and just move a little bit further along. So I've set that for another seven minutes. We've freed up the fingerboard at this point to the 4th fret. So now we're going to work from the 4th fret to about the 8th or ninth. So 7 minutes, a bit of a waiting game, and then we'll kind of hopscotch another 4 or 5 frets until we get this thing off clean. So we're heating right up through the depth of the fingerboard, right down to the glue line. you got to move carefully and slowly to get this off successfully right on the glue line without taking any wood with it. So far so good. I'm happy with that. We're lucky that it's real pearl inlay as opposed to plastic because it would melt under this heat. These are just kind of a multi-use plate that I initially used for the bridge slotting jig but I found that I've used them for multiple purposes like this one. You would have seen me use this on that horrendous 1959 VOS Les Paul special that we kind of basically resurrected from the brink of death. But I also use it uh, if you want to deepen an existing pickup cavity. The opening in the center of the plate is big enough, like much bigger than any pickup, and it allows you to, to drop a guide bearing in to deepen a pickup cavity. With that buffer wheel, I'm obviously heating up the probe, but it also serves to sharpen it as well. Okay, so we we'll remove that now. Get a closer look and see how much further. That feeler gauge up. So I'm hopscotching the probe and the feeler gauge. Oh, that's definitely coming. Looking good. Up to the seventh fret. And we will just continue from there. Okay, got another seven minutes. Yeah, so we're up to about the seventh fret. Well, this will probably take us up to 12. So we've released that up to the 11th fret. I think maybe we heat that once or twice more and that fingerboard will be off. Then we'll have a real good look. So let's see how far we get this time.
I'm pretty sure this is going to be our last go here. Still right on the glue line. So this is the culprit and this is why that fingerboard lifted and you would never be able to glue it back down. Removing the fingerboard in this case was exactly what needed to be done. So now we're completely in the driver's seat. You will get the play-by-play -play as always. This was one of those sober second thought approaches. The best thing I could have possibly done was remove that fingerboard. This thing will be better than the day it was made as far as the function of the truss rod goes and will have complete control over the lay of the neck. New frets. Joe will be a very happy camper. Well, our new truss rod, replacement truss rod, is installed. There was quite a bit of hand fitting. Let me show you this router jig that I used to get started on this one. Sometimes historically correct is wrong, and this is one of those cases. The uh, original truss rod didn't work at all, and it actually just served to pop the fingerboard off from the nut up to about the fourth fret. This is 1951. Epiphone quickly changed that truss rod. By 1953, they had gone to an adjustment at the headstock like this one. Let me show you this jig that I made up. So I cut these hockey pucks to use as indexing pins to hold the jig dead center. So that indexes into the slot. I started by clamping both ends and doing the center and then I slipped the jig along to get a little bit further up the neck. So this setup allowed me to hold it firmly dead center. The rest of the work was done by hand to get that final fit. There's the profile of the one hockey puck and there's the profile of the second hockey puck. So this hockey puck profile was used in the narrow end of the jig and this hockey puck profile held the wider portion of the jig while I cut. So I had to do it a little bit at a time and then I finished the fit by hand. I used the spherical cutter to make this relief cut for the truss rod adjustment, being careful not to touch the original inlay. There'll be a truss rod cover over top of that when we're done. We still have quite a ways to go yet. So I've just made a very shallow relief cut on the underside of this Epiphone fingerboard. And now we'll try it on the guitar, check it for fit. Well, you'll remember earlier in the video, there was a huge relief cut on the underside of that fingerboard. I filled it in, and as you just saw a second ago, sort of skimmed it out. So you see those tiny screws that I've got through the fret slots. They serve to align this fingerboard during the gluing process. But we're not gluing it on yet. Those frets are going in next before we glue it on. There's no way I want a chance hammering in frets over that top. And that's why we're putting the frets in first. The frets will be high enough that whatever minute discrepancies that we get along the string path, they'll easily come out of the crown of the fret. So we'll remove the fingerboard. This is one of those instances where you got to make up the rules of the game as you go. So I've got this attached to my truing board and I'm opening up all those slots for the new frets.
So I've got some 400 grit that I'm just breezing over and just making sure that there isn't any fragments puckered up on either side of the saw curve that would prevent the fret from seating properly. Okay, we'll chase that top end of the fingerboard now. So this is the procedure I have gone through with every single fret to get this kind of fit. So we start step one. Step two. Step three. Step four. Step six. So the seventh fret and the second fret will be driven in after the fingerboard is glued back on. And the reason for that is these four holes will serve as indexing pins to make sure that the fingerboard is perfectly aligned. So I adjusted those two sliding tabs to where I want them for this particular guitar neck. And a little drop of oil. Now I've closed it up and we're getting ready to install. So I want to bring you in close and just give you an idea of the decision making and thought processes. So I did chisel out all that loose chippy stuff. So I made up this template first to just get the profile of the piece that needs to fill that space. Obviously it swoops up on the end. I could not bring myself to leaving all those broken pieces I discovered after I removed the fingerboard. What I have here is a basswood model and I've got that to fit that I'm using for the maple insert that I'm about to make. So now we've restored that structural integrity of the fingerboard extension over the soundboard I'll let that set and I still got quite a bit of fret work to finish up before I glue that fingerboard on. And I'll show you the step by step on that one as well.
I'm bringing you in very close here to show you, and you've heard me mention this in numerous videos, be careful not to roll off the outside edge. Otherwise, those frets on the extremity, you'll always feel them. So, essentially what I've had to do, and I'll continue to do it, and I'll show you as I go. All of the frets are in, but after doing the edge dress, there's still an edge. Now, these two frets have been removed, the edge is buffed and reinstalled. But I'm going to have to do this to every single fret all the way along. Remove it, buff it, and reinstall it so that there is no sharp edges. It's essentially like doing the fret job twice. So now you know why I mentioned in all those other videos that when you get to the outside edge you want to make sure ultimately it should be sharp to the touch so that when you seat the fret the underside of the crown is firm against the fingerboard or the binding in this case. So we're gonna move along remove one fret at a time, buff it, crimp it, reinstall it. Much better. You want to make sure that the frets go in exactly where they came out. So I've got a little marker here. Black for base. So I mark the base side before I flex and crimp the tang to get a good mechanical fit. Definitely a long and tedious process, but we're aiming for perfection here, so I'm doing what has to be done. Because it's been edge dressed already, you got to make sure you get that fret in exactly where it came up. I'm going to over radius it slightly and, and again crimp that tang to get a tighter mechanical fit. Okay, all of the frets are in except the two pilot frets there that we're going to use for indexing the fingerboard. For those of you that watch my channel, you'll know that I'm not a big fan of actually using adhesives to glue frets in. But in this case, it was a combination of crimping the tang of the fret to get a better mechanical fit and then spotting it with basically with four dots of super glue the two outside edges and then two more small dots in the center of the fret. I'm gathering up some Brazilian rosewood dust from this uh, Brazilian rosewood veneer that I have. And we're going to use that to fill up any little chips and gaps from that last fret job where the guy glued the frets in. Pretty well got most of it. Yeah, that's looking pretty good. There wasn't a lot of damage, fortunately. Tapping that down in the deeper cavities.
So this is the file I'm using. The edges have been ground flush, so it's only this face that is the cutting surface. I'm making my way along here and basically leveling the uh, super glue and rosewood dust first with this file. Got the line share that off and just kind of making my way up the fingerboard to level the rest of this. So because there's no teeth on this edge, I, that brings me in tight to the fret when I'm doing this so we don't go messing up those nice new frets. So that Brazilian rose with dust has kind of filled any voids. The CA with that, uh, that glue boost stuff has basically bound it all together. We're doing the lion's share of the leveling with this file. Pretty tedious stuff. <laughs> this is like three times the work of just doing a fret job. But, you know, that's what happens when you got to clean up someone else's mess. But it's the end result that counts. I'm using this brass bristle brush, say that ten times in a row. Just to keep those uh, teeth clean. The Brazilian rosewood is actually pretty gummy, so it's got a high resin content, so this kind of oh that works much better. Okay. Bring that right down flush. So I'm favoring, tipping the file in just a little bit, kind of favoring that intersection of the bottom of the crown and the uh, rosewood dust filler. So that brings it in good and flush without scoring the new frets or the face of the fingerboard. So the razor blade is basically used to scrape up the last of the evidence of any filler or glue from the fingerboard surface. Whatever is on the frets, I'll take care of that after the fingerboard is glued and we're doing our final fret level of dress. I'll bring you in nice and close once we get this all cleaned up. So this is the gluing configuration. 
And I should mention, everything I did on this guitar so far was done on the XLT. Other than that maple backer block that you saw earlier in the video. And this is the clamping configuration for finally getting that fingerboard back into place. I'll explain this a little further once the glue sets and we pull those clamps off. Before I get on with the rest of the job, I want to bring you in here for a second and show you these hockey puck radius calls that I made. These were made on that new sander that you saw in the last couple of videos. So I put that radius on there so that when you clamp, it presses the two outside edges of the fingerboard to guarantee that you get that nice tight fit. And this little wedge here, I just kind of push that in when I was weighting that down to get a nice tight seam all the way along. I'm just getting ready to clean up that nut ledge and get that nut blank started. We're on the home stretch with this 51 Epiphone Emperor. This is our truss rod cover and this is done with engraving stock. You can pick this stuff up at any uh, trophy shop by the sheet. So that was cut to size and fitted. I went with a composite Brazilian rosewood and brass. Because the fingerboard is on a riser, a typical nut blank was not high enough for this. It's actually kind of nice because it's got that gold. We've got the EVO frets, which are kind of a gold color, gold screws to kind of match the machine head and the rest of the gold hardware. So the next thing I want to show you is a little trick I use for making a riser block. So this carved surface here, of course, it's not an even surface. So this is how I get around this. So I've got my plug cutter installed in the, in the drill press. So with this plug cutter, I cut out a walnut plug and I also cut out a couple of small circles out of that hockey puck. So that basically sandwiches the walnut between two pieces of rubber. On that new radius sander I basically cut that angle to get a fit. So I'll glue up that sandwich of rubber and walnut and that will be my riser for the pick guard. Well before this one leaves I just wanted to give you a look at the back and the neck on this thing. Look at the flame on the neck. And it's actually a bird's eye maple back. I so here's the back of the neck. Yeah, that's a much better angle. Kind of pick up the figure. And this is the back. So it's actually a bird's eye maple back carved. And as you can see, there is a crack. The, I think that crack is from long ago. It's solid though. So someone must have wicked some glue in there at some point. That's it. Well, here's another angle of the back. Well, that wire was actually resting up against the top, so I just taped that down before I put this pick guard on and give the customer a call. And that is our finished riser block for the pick guard. So it's rubber against the top, rubber against the underside of the pick guard, and then that little walnut chunk I showed you earlier. Well, this is it. Mission completed. I wish I could plug it in, but I just realized it's got that little eighth inch jack. But yeah, I'm going to take it into the studio and just kind of play it acoustically and see what it sounds like. So the controls and the pickup, that Kent Armstrong floating pickup, are retrofits. Well, at long last, the Emperor rises again. <laughs> Man, there were times I thought I was just never going to get there with this guitar. There are just so many challenges, especially that rolled over edge of the fingerboard. Man, that just killed me. It's like doing a fret job three times. But alas, it is done. So we have the brass and Brazilian rosewood composite nut, and of course the new two-way truss route. So this thing's completely adjustable now. And I found the cord to plug it in. So you will be able to hear it. So I recorded a progression in A. So 
So I've looped that, and uh, as always, I'll just kind of blow over top and uh, let you hear this thing. You know, I have to admit, when I was when I was at the workbench with this, and I kind of sat it on my lap to play. I mean, it's the body is huge. I, I could, even the neck. It's a thick neck, but I understand now why Joe hooks the strap onto the heel. He's smaller than I am. This this thing is the biggest guitar I've ever played. It's like 18 inches across the lower boat. So I'm going to let that play and just kind of noodle around and let you hear it. There's basically one pickup, that uh, Kent Armstrong floating pickup uh, with the volume control. And that's it. And believe me, that's all you need with this guitar. Have a lesson. <laughs> 